Um, so one of the lovely things about that introduction is that it allows me to just talk about the olden days um, and just be an old person who did all the old research on YouTube and look forward to all the new and exciting stuff that you guys are going to talk about. Uh, but first, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, this terrible mixed metaphor and what it might mean for how we might uh, study platforms like YouTube and other things. Uh, I'm going to read, but it's written to be read out loud, so it should be all right. So uh, I want to talk firstly about this word platform. Um, I say that we're in a platform paradigm currently. So the contemporary media environment is in part shaped by a relatively small number of proprietary platforms like YouTube, but also Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc., etc. And Jose van Dyck and Thomas Pearl talk about how the socio-technical and business logics of such platforms combine to create a broader social media logic that both shapes and is reflective of contemporary society, much as uh, mass, the idea of mass media logic was associated with the broadcast era. These platforms are then socio-cultural institutions. They play a central and embedded coordinating role in our social, cultural and political life. As Tarleton Gillespie and others have discussed extensively, platforms curate, regulate and govern our cultural and information environment. But the extent to which their social and cultural functions can be governed or regulated by us is still very uncertain. Think of the recent controversy about uh, Facebook's curation of trending news topics, for example, the confusion about whether this is automated or manual and what kind of role Facebook is playing in, um, in, in uh, journalistic practices, for example. So when I talk about Facebook, Twitter or YouTube as platforms, I don't just mean the companies that own them or even the apps they give us to use on our phones, tablets or smart TVs. I also mean their changing technical architectures, their business models, and very importantly, their cultures of use. This last one's most often left out of scholarly debates outside of the friendly environment of media communication and cultural studies, of course. But it's a fundamental principle of my approach that the everyday cultures, meanings, and value of social media platforms are co-created by their diverse user communities Although, of course, in conditions not of their own making, with agency and control very unevenly distributed. Such platforms are more, not less worthy of study in themselves now than they were 10 years ago, despite the fact that content and social experience and our data flow across them and through them. There are more of them every day, but some of them, like Facebook and arguably YouTube, are now more powerful than ever before we still need to know much more about what these platforms actually are, how they work, and how they shape our cultural and social landscape. But in a post-web, appified environment, in which digital media platforms are increasingly close to scrutiny, and for the most part proprietary, how are we to actually study them as platforms, especially as they change over time? So here comes the second part of my mixed metaphor. In seeking to address that challenge, you might wonder why I'm using the term biography here. Why not just history or, more controversially, evolution? Well, firstly, I think it's entirely appropriate to draw on life writing to talk about social media. Sure, the biogra biographical forms usually referred reserved for individual humans, although I know some corporations and racehorses and famous dogs have them. But of course, even when focused on the life story of a single human individual, the biography is inevitably and profoundly social, involving the subject's family origins, friendships and relationships, sexual secrets, in specific historical contexts. In museology and cultural anthropology, scholars also speak of the social biography of objects or things. And here, the biography is concerned not just with what a clay pot or a Bronze Age mirror can tell us about society at the time, but also the social history of the object itself, the hands it passed through, the way it was designed, produced, and shaped by social relations in the context of everyday life. Biography is also a useful approach to studying how platforms change over time because of its methodological limitations and maybe its literary rather than scientific character. 
Even in cases where the subject's life's already a matter of public record, as with heads of state and Kardashians, the biography is always partial, based on fragments of ephemera, interviews with unreliable witnesses, and especially given that biographies are sometimes posthumous. Where they're written about living people, of course, they quickly go out of date, and that is also very relevant here. Finally, just as we can't get inside the head of the person we're writing about to know what they really think, neither can we usually get inside the companies that provide the platforms, at least not without a very privileged kind of access, unavailable to most ordinary researchers and certainly to students. The platform biography is therefore the foundation for a specific kind of empirical approach, which I will get into concrete detail about a little later. But for now, let's orient ourselves to YouTube's life story by bringing out the baby photos, recalling the awkward teenage moments and thinking about its future prospects now that it's had yet another birthday, improbably, and reached double figures. So it's actually 10 years since YouTube uh, launched publicly. So going back to the uh, myths of origin here, uh, gee, it's not often you get to reuse slides from eight years ago, but here we are. Um, so you all know this story, right? Three young guys from uh, PayPal who set up this online video sharing widget called YouTube. Um, as I've said before, as a cultural institution, early YouTube was relatively underdetermined. It was a widget for web-based uploading, transcoding and sharing of short videos, something that had long been promised but that remained inaccessible to most ordinary internet users. The company knew it was for video sharing and hoped this would occur in the context of social network, which was the paradigm of the time for any uh, web startup. This is the height of Web 2.0 and the age of Friendster and the beginnings of Facebook. And in fact, they thought that video sharing might be somehow related to dating. And I don't know if you can see the detail of that screenshot, but um, up the top you could upload your videos and also sign up for online dating. Um, and uh, the material submitted as part of the, the Viacom lawsuit make it clear that the idea would be that you would upload videos of yourself um, being compelling to um, the, your target dating market and that then they would get in touch with you or something. It was all very uncertain right at the beginning. But apart from that, they were pretty agnostic about the content, form and genre of what was going to go on this service. And famously, while they were taken aback slightly by the sharing of short clips of broadcast material, like from The Family Guy, um, they turned a blind eye to copyright violation as long as they could. They didn't care what people were sharing as long as they were sharing and connecting. So very much the social networking paradigm. As with Flickr, the possibilities of mobile videography also seemed like the killer app for this. As the third co-founder, or as I like to call him, the fifth Beatle, <laughs> Jawed Karim demonstrated with his juvenile video shot at the San Diego Zoo, extolling the size of the elephant's primary appendage, its trunk. After a round of major investment by Sequoia Capital, YouTube was famously bought by YouTube in, by, sorry, by Google in 2006 for a couple of billion dollars in stock. By 2010, it was consistently in the top 10 websites visited globally. It had hundreds of millions of videos, which seemed like an awful lot, an impossible amount of content at the time, uh, leading to headlines like, more popular than television. Um, it would be nice if that was news now. It had already been the site of new forms of creativity, the emergence of new genres, new business models that are a mixture of traditional media and vernacular content. Everything from cat videos and vintage ads to HD movie trailers, the YouTube symphony orchestra, and ever more sophisticated participation in US presidential elections. Whatever YouTube was turning into, it was as a result of the co-evolution of user practices, media industry changes, and the website's architecture and business model. So, um, as I've argued many times before, the early YouTube was both underdetermined and it was co-created. Just uh, going back a few years, so the, the book that Joshua Green and I wrote, um, published in 2009, was actually based on data collected in 2007. So uh, this was the first major empirical study um, of the popular culture, cultural forms and practices that were emerging via the platform as it was in 2007. And we were very motivated by the 
main debates around YouTube at the time which concerned um, uh, uh, either the hype or fear that, that amateurs were going to take over the media landscape on the one hand, um, or that YouTube was uh, going to be a platform for mass piracy on the other. That was the dominant kind of um, theme of the debate at the time. So uh, it was a snapshot of what content was most popular on YouTube at the time, based on different metrics, which I'll show you in a moment. And it turns out it was a snapshot of YouTube just as it was going mainstream and beginning to monetize, just, as it, just before it localized and started to personalize content. So it was kind of the end of the universal early YouTube. Um, but just to remind you, this is before there were iPhones, this is before there were smart TVs, uh, before there were MCNs, although the, the traces of them are there, and certainly before there were four-year-olds earning six-figure salaries for unwrapping their shopping. So uh, in YouTube time, this is an eon ago. Uh, apologies if you've seen these slides before. I'm certainly a bit tired of them, but it's actually interesting to revisit this. This was a uh, big manual content analysis exercise um, of 4,000, more than 4,000 of the most popular videos. This was big data at the time. Um, when we used to introduce this data set, we used to get audible gasps from the audience. Um, how could you possibly deal with that much content? Uh, well, the answer was that we had a whole team of master's students at MIT working with us. Um, but uh, it was a response to the sense of massive scale here, that we had to have a really substantial sample. We had a web scraper set up running daily, capturing the lists of videos presented to users as most popular according to various metrics. So uh, you can see on the screen there, this is what you used to see when you went to the home page of YouTube. You used to be, sorry, when you went to the home page of YouTube and then clicked on the videos tab. So this was your primary means of content discovery. You clicked on videos and then you would actually pre be presented with what other videos had been most viewed or most commented or most discussed. So this wasn't, um, this was very pre-algorithmic, it was very much a database driven logic, completely different from today. So although we didn't know it, um, not only was it big data, which wasn't a term in use, it was also digital methods. We were using the methods of the medium to try to investigate how the medium worked. We coded for content type. So again, in response to those debates I was talking about, dividing it between traditional media content, content that appeared to come from a traditional media source or user-created content, content that appeared to come from outside of the media system. You can see why I'm doing the scary bunnies. Um, given the convergence between those two categories that we now see as part of YouTube. One thing that I actually think was very clever that we did was to separate that, that categorization from the categorization of uploaders. So we were trying to get at if there was mainstream media, as in television content on YouTube, was it uploaded by media companies or was it uploaded by ordinary users? And then we further coded the videos into genres or what we call video forms, as well as uh, a whole bunch of keyword descriptors to provide some nuance. Uh, this was the subject of much discussion um, with the master students at MIT, it took quite a while. So here's an example of, sorry, um, so out of this uh, we also did some close thematic analysis specifically concerned with controversies within the YouTube community. And out of that, we were able to identify some broad patterns and some interesting and regular competing tensions between social media logics and media industry logics, which we started to talk about as the two YouTubes. So here's an example of um, one of these content forms that turned out to be super important in the study vlogging, um, which was a portmanteau of video blogging, um, and now sounds very old fashioned, I realise. So user created content was generally far more commented on and responded to, and the dominant video form within that was the video blog. 
arguably the genre that gives YouTube its YouTubeness, even today. While being fundamentally based in confessional webcam culture, talking head camera, the genre had endless permutations from the earnest through the comedic and musical, so that we talked about YouTube's continuities with vaudeville. But what made YouTubing different from other forms of variety entertainment was its early integration with the logics of social media. Direct shout outs to fans, collaborations between vloggers and feuds among the network of YouTubers were essential to the idea of a YouTube culture or community in its early years. We argued that the YouTubers, whether casual and amateur or entrepreneurial and profit seeking, represented a subculture whose creative and innovative approaches to video production were deeply situated within the YouTube social network, with YouTube, the company and the platform playing the role of a coordinating institution, a socio-technical patron of creative activity. We also found that through adaptations of the simple talking head to camera form, um, it was via the situated practice of YouTube, of YouTubing as a verb that the political economy, the cultural dynamics and the social norms of YouTube were reflected on and critiqued. So there was this very interesting reflexivity in a lot of the most commented on, most discussed um, video blogs that were about YouTube and how it worked or how it was changing or how it should work or how it could work better. And we certainly see the continuity in this today with uh, regular controversies about changes to the platform. For example, the recent controversy around the so-called demonetization of long-standing content that contravenes YouTube's new advertiser-friendly content guidelines spilling across the web on hashtag, hashtag YouTube is over party. Ah, sorry, yes, some transitions there that I forgot about. But the drama isn't going anywhere either. Indeed, it's integral to YouTube's cultural logics and as monetizable as anything else. So um, this is a story on a channel called Drama Alert, which is a channel that focuses purely on reporting YouTube drama between YouTubers. How meta is that? So while the Broadcast Yourself tagline had disappeared entirely by 2012, all these forms and practices associated with early vlogging are absolutely essential to the practices and audience appeal of the cross-platform media performers and producers of today, whether on YouTube itself, um, as here in the, the millionaire YouTubers, featuring some people who've been around since the almost the very beginning, Smosh, Fine Brothers, PewDiePie, for example, or across Twitter, Vine, Instagram, and Snapchat. And Stuart Cunningham's gonna speak about this um, in detail later the idea of social media entertainment. The most subscribed channels, at least until it became impossible to fi easily find a list of the most subscribed channels, have consistently been based around YouTubers. Although, of course, the business arrangements within which their work is produced and revenue generated are infinitely more complex and multi-layered now than they were in 2007. Today, YouTube's, of course, a major player in what Stuart and John Silver call the new screen ecology of companies that commission, curate, and serve video content to audiences across a wide range of digital devices from smartphones to smart TVs. Coming up against major competition from Netflix and Amazon on the movie rentals and original content side, and now Vine, Facebook, and Twitch on the community building, live streaming, and hence advertising side of their business. YouTube has continued to negotiate and, I would argue, to be propelled forward by the tensions between advertiser-friendly respectability and the vernacular popular culture of the internet, managing to compete with other big players thus far by virtue of this unique culture and its broad appeal that is generated by those tensions, rather than by any particular technological or market advantage. The two YouTubes have competing business logics at times. In the domain of copyright, think for example about the competing interests of teenage lip sync artists or bedroom musicians and the record industry. Or think about the difference between advertisers' ideas of acceptable content and the rougher aesthetic required for apparently authentic self-expression on behalf of the YouTubers. But the two YouTubes also converge. Here, for example, you can see that YouTube Red's original programming strategy is as embedded in the platform vernaculars of YouTube, personified by some of its biggest stars, as it is in the older cultural logics of the broadcast media. 
and uh, for example, as well as providing ever more sophisticated media audience metrics to content creators, YouTube provides training and resources that focus on social models of audience engagement, which originated in YouTube's platform vernaculars and are now an ordinary part of the multi-platform media business. As we've seen with YouTube's training materials over the past five years, and as we can see here with the recent beta launch of the community tool for content creators, the, an app that's going to allow you to engage in real time across platforms um, with your fans. In another example of convergence between the two YouTubes, part of making the place advertiser friendly, the underlying basis of the media business, is to clean up comment culture and abuse. And the company is finally enrolling the community in that endeavour through the recently announced YouTube Heroes program at the same time and enhancing its affordances as a community platform for self-expression and interpersonal communication. So, um, where does that leave YouTube's life story? I mean, I've just told you a hopefully reasonably compelling story, but to ask a slightly disingenuous question, given everything I've just said, which of the two, tubes is, two YouTubes is gonna win? If it's true that the two YouTubes have converged or continue to diverge, how do we actually know? Surely the structure and the culture of the platform must have changed in detectable ways over the past 10 years. And um, I think intuitively we will all say, yes, of course they have. Can we look at this in a slightly more rigorous way than me flashing up a few screenshots and having a bit of a think about them? Wouldn't it be good if we could just repeat that big empirical snapshot study that Josh and I did back in 2007 well, no, it would be good, um, and no, we can't. As was most compellingly argued by Tim and Neil Finn in the classic Split End song, History Never Repeats, this is for a number of reasons. First of all, the data collection wouldn't work for technical reasons. It relied on a continuously running web scra scraper. While undoubtedly a large proportion of the actual videos will no longer exist, retrieving the lists could partly be addressed through the use of the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine, and something analogous could be done with the API, but it would be analogous. The pages we scrape to gather those lists of videos no longer exist as part of the architecture of the platform as users experience it. It's more than a technical implication. It's a change in how YouTube shapes and represents and invites you as a user to engage with its most popular content. Secondly, shortly after we completed our study, YouTube began to introduce localization and then personalization so that our study could never be repeated because there was no longer a global YouTube, although for a while global and US were the same thing. So again, this is not just a technical challenge, it's an indicator of significant platform change. And a change that we might study in itself is what I'm getting at. And I'm sure this has already occurred to all of you, but what on earth did we mean by traditional media content versus user-created content? Or traditional media versus indie versus ordinary users as uploaders? Distinctions that required a lot of careful and nuanced description at the time, but but ones that make absolutely no sense now. That's because YouTube's far more integrated into and with the rest of the media ecology than it was then. Again, this is something interesting and worth studying on its own. So how can a platform biography approach help here? Well, platform biography, as I've been indicating, offers a way to use the methods of the medium, as Richard Rogers refers to them, not only to describe the facts of or even the changes in the platform, but to use these changes to help tell the story of the way that uh, the platform's role, mission, industrial positioning have evolved. So this is what I mean by its platform biography. I'm going to illustrate this um, by going across platforms for a moment to talk about a current project that I'm finishing up, working with Nancy Bain where we're using what we have called the platform biography approach to study uh, Twitter's life story. It's forthcoming in a book by that title with uh, New York University Press next year. And it's interesting because like YouTube, Twitter's story is that of a journey from a small scale startup offering a mundane and ambiently intimate message sharing service to a major platform that is also a global media player. 
But along the way, competing ideas about its social purposes and its public as well as commercial value have coexisted and competed. Through all of that, apparently mundane, inconsequential features of the platform, like the at reply or at mention, the hashtag and the retweet, which we focus on in the book, have been the battleground for competing and converging desires and trajectories. We argue that they are the platform's key protocological objects, to borrow from Alex Galloway, and that they're therefore some of the key characters in the life story of Twitter as a platform. So we construct a partial biography of Twitter through the stories of these three features, each of which is originally a user invention, each of which has been a rich site of com competing communicative norms and values, and each of which has gone through significant changes accompanied by controversy or what Acker and Beaton called software update unrest. So the at reply, for example, well, the at symbol was first um, used to talk about both location, um, so you said you were at, uh, at the gym or what you were doing, so at work, and later um, used to, uh, to mention and address other users. But the proper use of it has been the site of a lot of debate within uh, the Twitter user community right from the beginning, leading to changes in how it was actually implemented in the platform to either make social interaction more visible or less visible. Famous line from these debates in the first year or so of the platform was, Twitter is not a chat room, it's for news. Around the same time as all the journalists picked up on Twitter's value as a news platform and started writing about how it was for news uh, and not for pointless babble and so on. That's one example. Um, similarly, the hashtag uh, invented to fill a need but was the site of a lot of debate about whether it should be for getting groups of users together or whether it should be for marking uh, topics or channels or whether it should just be used like um, as a tagging system. And it's universally hated by user experience people um, and the media kind of insiders at Twitter because it's, it's ugly and incomprehensible to newbies and so on and so on. So there's, there's always a threat that it's going to disappear. And then the retweet, similarly, um, a lot of contestation about the extent to which you should be posting original content versus um, just, just retweeting something from elsewhere. The integration of the button retweet, which automates the process of grabbing a link from um, a news story, for example. And um, I've got some big data that shows that the retweet has massively increased in prevalence and original tweets where people just say things that they're thinking have decreased in prevalence alongside those platform changes. So there's a surprisingly large amount of stuff to say about these three very mundane but um, absolutely fundamental features of the Twitter platform. So back to YouTube. Um, could you apply this model, and I'm not going to suggest you could apply it directly um, because there's a few specific things about Twitter, like the fact that these features were invented by users, that the platform itself has actually gone through comparatively few major changes and um, certainly doesn't have the expansive range of business models, famously, that YouTube does. But could you apply this kind of approach to the protocols um, the conventions, the features of YouTube as a platform. And I actually don't have the answer to that. I'm hoping that we're going to have a little bit of a discussion to start off the conference and get us all interacting. But some suggestions might be um, the popularity metrics that are visible to audiences, the back-end um, metrics that are available to creators, and here's another big difference from Twitter. I've already had to talk about what audiences see versus what creators see. Um, copyright management protocols. Um, just advertising. It might be really interesting to trace the different forms 
um, and experiments with advertising from the beginning to now. Um, plenty of materials available in the tech and media press about that. So uh, I'm going to leave there and hand over to all of you experts in contemporary YouTube research and hopefully we'll have a nice discussion about that. So thank you for your attention.